Hello. In this video, we're going to talk about uh, the pi molecular orbitals for conjugated systems and try to show you how they provide a different way of understanding the structure of conjugated systems that, uh, than, than you might otherwise expect from a valence bond perspective. Uh, these pi molecular orbitals can help us identify frontier molecular orbitals, which is what the next video is going to be about. Uh, but those frontier molecular orbitals then are useful for under understanding the outcome of paracyclic reactions, uh, which are a type of reactions that only conjugated molecules can do. And then finally are also useful for the prediction of UV visible absorption spectra. Uh, and there's going to be a video coming up on that. So here's the uh, molecular orbital diagram for ethene. Uh, and this actually looks like uh, the very similar in the last video when I introduced the pi bond uh, molecular orbital diagram. Now, yes, there are one, two, three, four, five sigma bonds in ethene as well, but we're only going to talk about the pi orbitals from this point forward. Now, there are two carbon atoms. Each carbon atom has a p orbital that it contributes to the pi bond. That means two molecular orbitals uh, with pi symmetry one bonding, one anti-bonding, and both electrons end up in the bonding orbital. And that's going to be sort of generally the case. The electrons are going to end up in the bonding orbitals in, in these examples. And here's a picture of what those look like. Um, <coughs> the bonding orbital on the bottom and the anti-bonding orbital on the top. And this is kind of what you would expect. The bonding orbital uh, looks like that, the, the sort of traditional drawing of a pi bond where you have above and below the plane of the molecule electron density shared between the two atoms. The anti-bonding orbital kind of looks like a, like a distorted set of p orbitals kind of pushing away from each other. Now this is this is where we're starting with ethene uh, and ethene is uh, not actually conjugated so um, here here comes the conjugated orbitals for 1,4 butadiene. I don't, I don't know what that animation thing where they came in in the wrong order. So I apologize for, for that. 1,4-butadiene um, has four carbon atoms, four p orbitals, four molecular orbitals, at least in the pi case. And there, yeah, I'm not talking about the, the sigma bond orbitals right now. Uh, each carbon atom brings an electron to the system. So there are four electrons and they go into the two bonding orbitals. And here are what those orbitals look like. So this is the lowest energy bonding orbital and there is electron pi electron density stuff smeared across the whole structure all four orbitals line up to generate something that looks like that this is what the uh, next bonding orbital looks like so here we have constructive overlap between carbon one and two a node between two and three, and constructive overlap between three and four. This is kind of a drawing you might look at and say, oh yeah, there are two pi bonds there. But I want you to remember that this is a single molecular orbital. There were two electrons in that orbital. Uh, spread across all four atoms, there's just a node in between. Uh, here's the lower energy uh, unoccupied antibonding orbital. And... Uh, it has actually has some bonding overlap between carbons two and three, but anti more more nodes than it has bonding overlap. And then here is the, the highest energy pi molecular orbital. And if you can see, uh, this one alternates blue, red, blue, red. Uh, and so there's a node in between every carbon atom. And you're going to notice this trend. Every one of the highest energy pi orbitals is going to have a node in between every carbon atom. And every one of the lowest energy orbitals is going to have no nodes in between the carbon atoms. And you do uh, 1, 3, 6, X triene. And again, sorry for the weird animation stuff. Uh, six carbon atoms, six p orbitals, six electrons, six pi orbitals. And the electron pairs go into the first three, which are the bonding orbitals. And here's what they look like. Lowest energy bonding orbital, continuous electron smear across the whole thing. Second bonding orbital has a node in the middle of the molecule. Next bonding orbitals, this is the highest energy 
bonding orbital looks actually like three individual pi bonds. But again, this is one molecular orbital. So you don't, uh, don't let yourself think that there's this three bonds here in that picture. Four nodes, I'm sorry, three nodes in the, the fourth orbital still looks like some bonding between some of the atoms, five, four nodes in the, the fifth orbital, and then five nodes in the sixth orbital, and again, alternating down the the atoms. Uh, the 136 hexatriene really highlights um, the, the linear combination uh, concept that goes into constructing molecular orbitals, where you can look at the six different pi molecular orbitals and get a pretty clear understanding that not every p orbital on every atom contributes equally to every pi orbital. And that is generally the case. I want to show one more, uh, and that is the allyl system. So this is a three carbon system. Not all textbooks go into the three carbon system, but I think it's really good example of how molecular orbital theory complements resonance or, or just, just deals with resonance. Uh, so I've drawn the structure of the allyl cation and its principal and its two principal resonance contributors up there at the top. There are three carbon atoms. Each of those three carbon atoms has a p orbital, but because it's a cation, there are only two electrons in the system. And I have a typo here. This should say psi two. Uh, so I apologize for that. But both electrons go into the lowest energy orbital, which is a bonding orbital. I have an anti-bonding orbital up here on the top, but this middle orbital, this middle orbital has the same energy actually as the individual p orbitals did. Uh, and so we would classify this as a non-bonding orbital. Any electrons that would be in that orbital are not actually part of covalent bonds. Um, and so if I did have a pair of electrons there, they would show up as a lone pair and they would be the lone pair contributing to the radical or to the, to the allyl anion. And in fact, yeah, molecular orbital theory does sort of handle lone pairs as well. They might just not be quite as localized as you would expect. Here are the three uh, molecular orbitals. Again, at the bottom, the low energy one is smeared across all the atoms. At the top, the antibonding orbital has nodes in between each carbon atom. But the middle one is really interesting. The middle one kind of has orbital stuff at the ends and nothing in the middle. And if you look at the, the resonance structure of the allo cation, the cation is either at carbon one or at carbon three, and it's never in the middle. This empty non-bonding orbital is at carbon one and carbon three and never in the middle. And so the molecular orbital picture of the allyl cation and other allyl species complements the, the resonance picture very nicely. In the next video, I'm going to introduce you to the idea of frontier molecular orbitals um, and, and how those can be used. And then I'll wrap up this video sequence talking about uh, UV visible absorption spectroscopy very briefly. There's a lot to be said about that, so I'll be brief. Thank you for watching.